Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture for chapter two, which is called Portraying the Earth. As you just watched that short video from the West Wing, um, you know there are many ways to portray the Earth, besides the ones that we are kind of used to looking at. On the title slide here, we can see a world map that is upside down, which there's really nothing wrong with a world map that's upside down. And as that video showed us, maps were created really um, by Europeans, um, at least a lot of the maps that we had today, and through um, colonization of most of the planet, those maps stuck. But we can really portray the globe in a variety of ways. And so again, one of the other things that I want you to think about and why we are um, looking at the maps throughout this chapter is that the Earth is a sphere. And so if you have ever tried to um, wrap a ball in paper, you will know that it is kind of imperfect, right? So imagine if you were just going to peel the outside off of that planet and kind of lay it flat, you're going to have to distort and stretch out some things. So we're trying to um, display a three-dimensional shape with a two-dimensional object, which leads to some distortion. And we have to make choices about how we are going to distort. But first, let's talk about the fact that there are two types of maps. Um, the first is a reference map. A reference map shows um, general features. So if you go on your smartphone and look at a map of San Diego, that's a reference map, right? It's showing us exactly where things are. Um, so here is a reference map of the United States that's showing us um, the uh, 48 uh, continental United States, or contiguous United States. The other type of map are thematic maps. Thematic maps display a theme or a certain type of data. Geographers love thematic maps. Um, they allow us to play with data and show um, all types of phenomena uh, through geographic maps. They can literally be anything. Um, and we'll look at some examples of those. Your assignment for chapter two will be about thematic maps partially. Um, so think about that while we're looking at this part of the lecture. Um, so here is um, a thematic map looking at dog states versus cat states, um, right? California has more cats, which is very disappointing to me. I have two dogs, but apparently I'm not making that big of a difference. Um, apparently I'm also from Connecticut, which is a tiny state in the Northeast, which is also a more cat state. But um, basically, uh, you know, looking at more cats versus more dogs. Um, here is another thematic map, which is looking at Internet usage globally, right? So we can tell that a lot of sub-Saharan Africa um, lacks um, the internet. A lot of parts of the Amazon in South America. Um, Australia is a funny example. Um, let's see if I can move my cursor down here. There we go. There's Australia right there. Um, Australia, while is a really industrialized nation, much of the interior is very hot and inhospitable. So most of the people in Australia live along the coastlines. Um, this is a map looking at um, Facebook usage and Facebook connections. Um, so most Facebook users being in the United States and in Europe, um, but certainly in parts of Asia and again, those um, um, parts of Australia and also looking at where their friends are connected to. So most of the connections in the United States are within the United States, but also to, we can see to Hawaii. Um, so let's see again if I can move this. There's the U.S., there's Hawaii out there, right? A lot of Hawaii is connected. Also, you can see connections between Hawaii and Alaska. Um, there's actually a strong cultural connection between Hawaii and Alaska, which is pretty interesting. Um, this is a map looking at every place the United Kingdom colonized at some point, right? And it's a decent portion um, of the globe. Uh, there was a uh, saying when... Uh, Britain is what was at its height of colonization that the sun never set on the United Kingdom. Um, this is a world happiness map. It's a ranking of 156 countries based upon a variety of things. And these uh, world happiness things will change depending on who you're talking to. But uh, the happiest countries tend to be um, in Northern Europe, um, the bottom ranked being places like Rwanda, Burundi, the Central African Republic. The next thing I want to talk about is scale on maps. And we talked about scale a little bit um, when we talked about uh, looking at geographic concepts. But also when we want to talk about scale on a map, it lets us know um, 
how much of the surface area of the planet the map represents. And so it's a ratio by which the real world is shrunk. So if we look at a small scale map, and it's going, it's a little counterintuitive because a small scale map up here is actually a larger map displaying more area than a large scale map. Um, but a small scale map on this map, um, one inch equals 1500 miles. Here, one inch equals 600 miles, one inch equals 250 miles, one inch equals 21 miles. But the scale, um, right, for a large scale map is one to one million three hundred thousand. So we're zooming in. As we zoom in, the scale gets larger. Right, example, one to 24,000. More space depicted versus more detailed features. So we use different maps of different scale depending on what we want to look at. We want to know where the 50 states are. We're going to use a small scale map. We want to know how to get around um, at least the metro Atlanta area. We're going to use a large scale map. We want to go get down to, to how we get around our neighborhood. We're going to look at a very large scale map. Map projections, which the short video that you watched also talked about, are different ways that we take that three-dimensional sphere and look at it in two-dimensional space, right? So it's ways of portraying a three-dimensional Earth in two dimensions. And this, these things are going to be inherently flawed. All projections distort, every single one of them. Some distort size, some distort shape, um, some distort both size and shape. In fact, most distort both size and shape um, to some degree. Different projections are used for different purposes. The Mercator projection, um, which is the one at the top here, was um, really good for navigating um, on the ocean, but not necessarily for um, other things. And so it really distorted size. And so we saw in that video that um, sub-Saharan Africa is made to look much smaller than it actually is um, uh, in the real world. Um, so you want to think critically about a map when you look at it. You want to think about um, what it is representing, who made it, why did they made it, what is the purpose of them making it. There up top you see the Gauls peter projection, and you see how sub-Saharan Africa looks significantly bigger, um, not even just sub-Saharan, just all of Africa looks significantly bigger than it does here, um, and Europe looks much, much smaller. Um, and here are some... Um, distortion examples. <clears throat> so you have um, here is an equivalent where um, the size is preserved, but not necessarily um, the shape. Oops, sorry. Um, and here you have, again, that Mercator projection where the shapes are preserved, but the size is really distorted. So again, Greenland here is much, much smaller than Africa, as opposed to when we look at it here, it looks almost equivalent in size. Um, distortion happens on not just world maps. When we look at very, very large scale maps, very, very local maps, um, that distortion is, is pretty minimal, um, but uh, it does happen. So uh, we can look at different types of projections. This is a plane projection where you basically just pull up um, part of the earth. It's not gonna show the entire earth um, and it looks like this, right? We don't necessarily have to look at the earth the way that we do. We can look at it upside down and sideways. Um, this is a conic projection, so imagine you wrapped paper around it and pulled it like this. If you look at the lines here, again, the parallels of latitude, you can see which way distortion is happening, right? They're not going straight across. So let that grid guide you, right? We can know how this is distorted based upon the fact that this is curved in this way. A Mercator projection has those parallels going straight across. Um, there are a variety of type of complex projections. You don't need to know them all, um, but just some examples. Um, this is um, a um, pseudo cylindrical map. Um, this is an interrupted projection. Um, this, these have gained some popularity just because we don't necessarily care um, when we're talking about land, what that ocean looks like in the middle. Um, so this helps preserve some of that size, but some places like uh, Greenland, you're gonna get chopped in half. Um, and then an or orthographic projection, which distorts both size and shape, but it makes compromises to make things kind of more even. 
Um, generally speaking, in universities now and in a lot of schools, depending on how up to date they are, you're going to see this orthographic projection um, or one similar to it rather than looking at that Mercator projection, which um, when I grew up, it was all we looked at was a Mercator projection. Um, the thing is, though, is that if you go to um, many stores, um, if you go to Ikea and buy a, a, a world map to hang on your wall and, and decorate, if you buy that world map shower curtain, most of them are still that Mercator projection. That one is kind of very, um, has pretty strong cultural ties to us, right? And again, we can look at the Earth however we want, right? Here is, um, you can see Antarctica is split into four in this. This is looking down at the North Pole. Um, and wow, can we see the difference uh, here, where's my cursor, between uh, Greenland and Africa, dramatically different. So this does, this does more size, but it's going to get more distorted kind of as we go out. Isolines are lines of equal value of a variable on a map. We will see these types of maps used for a lot of things, um, including topography, elevation, um, precipitation. And so this is a map that looks at elevation. And so um, it's a little hard to see on this, but this has a 500. And this means that everything on this line all the way around is at 500 degrees above sea level. It means that everything on the other side is below that and above that. So um, ISO lines will, are really good for elevation maps. Um, before uh, we use GPS to go on our hikes out in nature. We would have to use these um, topographic maps, which would let us know, you know, how high that climb was going to be up that mountain um, in order to kind of plan our hike out. Um, so it's at equal intervals, right? So um, you're going to have a 500, a 600. Um, so this one is using um, 100 feet. Um, all points on a line have the same value. So here's another example of an ISO line map. This is average annual precipitation um, in uh, Africa. Um, here is um, surface temperature in the United States for Friday, July 12th of 2013. Um, so it's not that everything in here is 85 degrees. Oh, sorry. It's not that everything in there is 85 degrees. It's everything on that line is 85 degrees to one way is higher to one way is lower. Um, here's a climate map uh, for um, the island of Hawaii. The island of Hawaii, um, which is the, the big island in Hawaii, has um, uh, the most climates on it for a small island. Um, you can get snow on the island and monsoons, and then you also have deserts. It's fairly amazing. If you haven't visited, I highly recommend it. You can drive around it in one very long day um, and, and go from rainforest to desert. And so... Looking at other types of maps, if we look at this map, this is a um, land use, land cover classification map for Tennessee. Um, and so basically what this map is telling us is, uh, you know, what types of vegetation more? We can see the light green is deciduous forest, then there's mixed forest, there's urban and developed. Um, and so traditionally speaking, when people made maps, um, when we first made maps of the United States and of the world, people had to go out um, and make these maps themselves. They had to take the measurements, um, figure out, map things, write them out, and they were kind of imperfect. What we use now for most of these maps, right, we're not going to go out and map all of this stuff on this very fine scale, is we use something called remote sensing. Remote sensing is a mapping technology that is heavily used by geographers, um, and you see remote sensed images all the time. And basically we're using satellite imagery in order to look at the planet, um, sometimes which we'll make maps out of. So here is an image of the 2007 California wildfires, right? Remote sensed imagery was used in order to find out where the big fires were, where the smoke was going to. Um, geographers at San Diego State um, are heavily involved when uh, big wildfires break, break out. Um, they do voluntary mapping um, with remote sensed imagery. Something like this previous map um, might use infrared. We will talk about infrared imagery, um, I think, in the next lecture in Chapter 3. Um, but basically, we're using satellite imagery now more and more to create very, very fine detailed maps. 
And if you looked at Google Street View, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. You're going to have to do it at some point during this semester anyways. Um, you can just see how incredible the satellite imagery is um, that you can look at of your own house now. Um, the other thing, the other tech mapping technology we use is global positioning systems. There's going to be a short video on the after this lecture looking at the history of GPS, um, which you will watch a short video. Um, so basically using satellite imagery in order, not satellite imagery, using satellites um, that ping off of each other in order to give us very specific locations on the planet. And so my phone knows where I am because of GPS. Uh, way back when, before our phones were smart um, and we would have GPS units that were pretty darn expensive uh, in order to, um, let's say if I was gonna go hiking out somewhere in the wilderness, I might have this GPS unit, which was very, very basic, had like a pea green screen, and I would hold it up and try to map a point, and I would have to wait to get enough satellites to do it. Um, now, it's the technology is incredibly fast and incredibly amazing, right? It's not very often that our phone has a hard time finding where we are. Um, this technology has come a really, really long way um, in a very, very short amount of time. And lastly, the last mapping technology, and this will be the last slide of chapter two, um, is geographic information systems. Geographic information systems um, uses um, a variety of tools in order to make maps. Very technical, um, very comprehensive maps of just about anything that you can imagine. Um, it does so using G something called GIS analysis. You could take all types of data. Um, UPS will use it to figure out the fastest and most efficient way to get to your house. Um, ambulance companies will use it to figure out how many ambulances they need in a given city um, in order to serve everybody within 15 minutes. Um, I highly recommend, no matter what field that you're planning on going into, um, that you take a GIS course at some point. Um, it's so useful. It's such an amazing job skill to hire. And um, GIS analysts are in demand. Um, it's one of the reasons why people that come out of a geography major are some of the most readily employed um, college graduates. So that is the end of chapter two. Uh, what you're going to do now is watch a short video on um, the uh, history of GPS, which